Meisari mare iso fer von me hart mare kuk om habir tusien seichet in di vek van di moir hi gewon noch vor di urlochet begen. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Ms. Hayes uh, very much for allowing me to do this presentation and to share my experiences with you and show you slides of Africa as I first found it when I visited it for the first time about 25 years ago. And I've divided the slides, or what they say in French, the apositiva, into two broad categories. Uh, L'Afrique du Papa, to use a Gaulist turn of phrase, uh, photos of decadent paternalistic regimes in Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, uh, and South Africa. In addition, there are photos of uh, Afro Nouveau, or independent Africa, uh, nations such as Ghana, Senegal, Mauritania, and Algeria. So here is Zimbabwe, renamed Zimbabwe in 1980. Uh, with the, the advent of majority rule. South Africa, which has basically retained its name, but is now also uh, less of a uh, apex of tension. It's now independent, of course. Uh, and slides of uh, uh, Senegal, where I spent a year as a Fulbright, uh, Mauritania, where I visited, and Algeria, which was the subject of, uh, of my dissertation. Now, as a friend of Africans, I look forward to giving a speech not as one who's merely read, read textbooks and scholarly tomes about Africa, but as one who's traveled in the continent, uh, as one who has become involved with the problems of a great number of people of different cultural backgrounds there. And so I speak not as, a, uh, as some sort of armchair scholar, but really as, to a certain extent as an active participant in a positive sense. So the first slides I'd like to show you are of Zanzibar. And Zanzibar is... Uh, is comprised of two islands off the east coast of Africa, right off the of Here you see the former residences of some of the most notorious Arab slave traders in the 19th century, who dealt quite heavily in the sale of spices and slaves. One hears so much negativity about the new imperialism, 1883-1914, when various European powers at the Berlin Conference of 1883, carved up the continent among themselves into various spheres of influence. But a positive aspect of new imperialism was the effort to eliminate definitively the Muslim slave trade in East Africa, whose main victims were Native Africans. These notorious slavers built expensive homes and competed with each other to construct elaborate doors to their residences. So these are just some examples of this rivalry among the Arab slavers to build doors on their townhouses in Zanzibar City. The main strategy used to eliminate slave trading among the slavers was bribery. They were paid by European colonial powers to cease their very profitable traffic in human flesh. Here you see various photos taken in Zanzibar looking out to the Indian Ocean. This is the house of David Livingston, the famous missionary and explorer who went to Africa in the 1850s and settled in a small village called Ujiji in the Congo to minister to Africans, which was where the journalist Henry Morton Stanley found him and uttered the immortal words, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Livingston's missionary work is another example of the positive side of the new imperialism. Here we see other examples of Muslim architecture on the island of Zanzibar and in da downtown Zanzibar City. Here is a hotel built by the English during the Protectorate. The gentleman seen here in the lower right-hand corner is wearing a shisha, indicating that he is a Muslim. Once again, we see here the same hotel, as well as the ruins of an old fort, which had not uh, stood the test of time well and like many other buildings and cenotaphs on the island, was in need of restoration. 
Here I am in the doorway of the fort, which was then in ruins. This is a rock formation in Rhodesia, where I lived for a while after UDI and during the Second Chimarenga, or Second War of Liberation. Here we see the final resting place of Cecil John Rhodes in a rocky area uh, in Rhodesia, near Bulawayo, known as the Matopos. Rhodes gave his name to what became uh, known as Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and he was one of Africa's most influential imperialists. This is a monument dedicated to the Alan Wilson Patrol. Wilson was one of the pioneers in Rhodesia who, in the 1890s, lost his life as a result of injuries incurred in a series of African wars. This is the Indaba tree. Indaba in the Indabeli language in Rhodesia uh, meant powwow, and it was under this tree that the great African chieftain, Lobangula, conducted tribal business. Here we see the ruins of the ancient civilization of Zimbabwe. This is the hut where Rhodes persuaded Lobangula, whom he called with familiarity, a lob, to sell him the rights to mineral deposits throughout the country. Disingenuously, Rhodes explained that he wanted nothing that was above ground, but only what was below the earth. Of course, virtually all of the precious minerals in what became Rhodesia, gold, oil, platinum, interalia, were found below the earth. Here we see shots of downtown Bulawayo, Rhodesia's second largest city after Salisbury. The word Bulawayo in the Indabeli language means place of slaughter. The reason that the streets appear deserted is that I took these photos on the weekend of Rhodes and Founders Day, celebrated there just as our 4th of July is celebrated here. Most residents of Bulawayo were away on holiday. Streets in Bulawayo were built wide, as you see here, to accommodate wagon trains. We also see Indian stores and places of commerce, and as in other parts of Africa, Indians constitute a comprador, commercial class, socially and economically between whites and native Africans. Here we see another cenotaph, a war memorial, with a Gatling gun perched atop to commemorate the pacification of the country by soldiers sent by roads from South Africa in the latter part of the 19th century. Here we see a hotel and the train station in Bulawayo. This is a photo taken of City Hall in Bulawayo. This is the Limpopo River that divides Rhodesia and South Africa. Here we see a fire station in, in Salisbury. The Rhodesian white electorate was not monolithic in its support of Ian Smith's Rhodesian Front Party and the perpetuation of right, white rule. Here's a statue of Cecil Rhodes erected in downtown Salisbury. There were also liberal white Rhodesians who supported the party of Garfield Todd, head of the, the United Rhodesia Party, which came out in support of majority rule. Here we see Parliament House, as well as the offices of Air Rhodesia, which ran flights only between Salisbury and Johannesburg, which I took, by the way, numerous times, as well as the headquarters of the Rhodesian Front Party, which is behind UDI, or the Unilateral Declaration of Independence in 1965, which kept power within white hands until the advent of majority rule in 1980. Other pictures of Parliament House are seen in Salisbury. And in taking these photographs, one felt as though we were documenting the end of a way of life, which in fact I was. Here is a photo of a statue of Paul Kruger, or Um Paul, uh, as he was known to his Afrikaner people, as well as photos of administrative buildings in Pretoria in South Africa. This is an example of Cape Dutch architecture. 
It was formerly a private house and now it's a museum. Here is a photo of a hotel in the Orange Free State, or as one says in Afrikaans, Oranje Freestadt, the most conservative province in South Africa. The word Handelhes, which you see on the facade of the uh, hotel, means commercial establishment uh, in Afrikaans. And Afrikaans is a, uh, is a form of Dutch and fairly easy to learn. These are photos taken from a cable car which goes to the top of Table Mountain and from which one can see Land's End, or the convergence of the Indian and Atlantic Oceans. This is a monument to Bartholomew Diaz, the first navigator, who by the way was uh, Portuguese, to round the Cape in 1498. Here we see the, a photo of the bush taxi in Ghana and the bus station at Bogotanga in Elmina, the slave prison in Cape Coast, which is now a museum. Then there's a picture of me with the proviseur of the Lycée John F. Kennedy in Dakar while I was on a Fulbright there in 1995. Here are pictures of uh, some of my students at the Lycée John F. Kennedy. Uh, they were in what they call the um, uh, class terminal, uh, the last year of high school. The average class size was 50 students per class. Here I am with two other Fulbrights, also assigned to Senegal. Here you see some of my colleagues at the Lycée John F. Kennedy at a farewell party for, for us Fulbrights in the lounge at, uh, at school. This is a view of the train station in Dakar. This is a view looking down from my apartment in Dakar. Uh, apartment building overlooks the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Another view of downtown Dakar. Here is a photo of a kitten who followed me up 13 flights of stairs in the building where I lived. I reckon if, that she, if she were that determined, she deserved to come to the United States, States with me. I brought her to America and I named her Sarah Bell. She was adopted by a, a dear friend of mine, the late Rachel Tversky, a professor of English, uh, who looked after Sarah Bell until she passed away over a decade later. Accompanying her to the States was the dog you see here, Dorian, or Doré in French, so named because of his beautiful golden eyes, and who remained with me for a good number of years in New York until he finally passed away in 2002. Dorian was a true and loyal friend. In conclusion, I want to thank all of you for listening, and I hope that my brief expose has given you some understanding of life in the bright continent as it unfolded almost a quarter of a century ago. I was fortunate to have lived in Africa during a turning point in its history. It's a continent to which one becomes quickly and profoundly attached. As they say, and anyone who has lived there will attest to this, l'Afrique monte à tête, Africa goes to one's head. Once again, thanks. That's clear enough, huh? Yeah. Merci, yeah.